Hello friends, welcome to One Academy. Let's crack neat PG. I'm Dr. Shonali Chandra and in today's session we will be having a case scenario based approach to uh, molar pregnancy here. So um, telling you about um, the topic at hand for today where we are going to discuss the um, topic at hand molar pregnancy for you guys here I have uh, curated it and uh, what we are going to discuss is a case-based approach to diagnosis of molar pregnancy I have highlighted my referral code here so you can subscribe to the Unacademy platform and you can use this code to avail a 10% discount on your subscription package as well you can download the Unacademy learning app on your mobile phones and get notified about the upcoming special classes upcoming crash courses or long duration batch courses as well so on the platform friends you'll get daily live classes where you can chat with your educator you know ask your doubts and queries and get them solved there and then so it's like a live classroom experience the courses are structured keeping in line with the latest neat pg syllabus there are also live tests and quizzes that are conducted on the platform so that will help you you know evaluate your performance along the way and one time subscription gives you an unlimited access so you can watch all the live sessions from all the faculties who are active on the platform any number of times and even if you miss out on the live session you know you can always go back and watch the recorded versions from the comfort of your own devices top educators are associated with the platform all subjects which we need to prepare for our post-grad entrance examinations they are covered every now and then comprehensive batch courses as well as short duration crash courses they keep getting launched so giving you an overview of the kind of courses that are being conducted so there's a focus batch for fmg 2021 short duration batch from feb to may there's a last mile to crack neat pg 2021 again it's a short duration crash course there's a target next batch which is going to cater to the exam that is going to be conducted in 2022 a target batch again you know there's a morning and evening separate batches as well so you can choose one depending on your needs and requirements my friends and now you can also subscribe to the iconic uh, subscription which allows you to access an academy and prep ladder at the same time now you can choose this iconic subscription for 12 18 24 or 36 months duration and if you subscribe using my code then you can avail an additional 10% discount on your subscription package talking about the various neat pg plus subscription packages again there are various modules you can choose one depending on your needs and requirements like for example if you're targeting the upcoming exams and want a shorter duration crash course then you can take the one or three month duration subscription package if you're targeting the next exams then you can take the longer duration package like 12 months it will give you ample time to go through all of the sessions in a systematic approach and also will leave you enough time in the end to revise as well as and you can see you know and on a monthly basis it turns out to be more economical also and for those of you who are in your third year final year MBBS or you're working simultaneously you want a slower pace of preparation then you can take the 24 months duration package it turns out to be far more economical in the longer run and if you subscribe using my code you can also avail a 10% discount on your subscription package as well while you're on the platform you can check out uh, the previous special classes that I've already undertaken on the platform now these are free so anybody who enters the platform can access them and there are also various capsule courses like there's one on high risk pregnancy gynae oncology clinical situations in early pregnancy labor and its complications reproductive gynecology now these are detailed theoretical courses but they are plus courses for that you'll have to subscribe to the platform and you can use my referral code to avail a 10 percent discount on your subscription package as well so coming back to the session at hand Swati, Rohit, Prithvi, Parveen, Shah good evening to all of you guys thank you for joining in and let's get started without wasting any further time and let's just quickly revise what is molar pregnancy so molar pregnancy is belonging to a group of diseases and disorders which we call as gestational trophoblastic diseases now these gestational trophoblastic diseases can be benign so the benign ones are the ones which include molar pregnancy which can be of two types complete mole and partial mole 
right and on the other hand gestational trophoblastic diseases can turn out to be malignant as well now when they are malignant they are called as gtn that is gestational trophoblastic neoplasia and they include invasive mole right which is um, malignant it is locally invasive right then we have the choriocarcinoma placental site trophoblastic tumor endothelial uh, cell trophoblastic tumor so these are definitely very very rare kinds of uh, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia and today we are going to focus our discussion on the benign ones that is molar pregnancy complete mole and partial mole now the next question that I want to ask you is what causes molar pregnancy to begin with? Why does molar pregnancy occur? What is the reason behind it? What is wrong with this uh, pregnancy? Right? So these are chromosomally abnormal fertilizations right so what happens in fertilization there is a sperm there is an egg right they have haploid number of chromosomes they fuse together to form a zygote and the zygote is diploid containing both maternal nuclear material and paternal feeder nuclear material right but here something goes wrong so what happens in a complete molar pregnancy you see here there is an empty egg there is an empty egg. Why is it empty? Because the maternal chromosome inactivation has taken place, right? And that gets fertilized by a single sperm, okay? And after that, after fertilization, there is paternal chromosome duplication, okay? That results in a final diploid organism, but this diploid organism is not normal. This conceptus is not normal because all the genetic material, all the nuclear genetic material is actually paternal. There is no maternal chromosome, no maternal nuclear material at all. So what did we see? That we had a single sperm, monospermic, single sperm fertilizing an empty egg and later on the sperm DNA duplicated resulting in a diploid conceptus which actually contained only paternal genetic material. So that's abnormal and this results in a complete mole, complete mole. So complete mole are most commonly monospermic. They can be diaspermic but rarely they are mostly monospermic. And another MCQ that they ask you in you know, exams is what is the most common karyotype of a complete mole? So what is the most common karyotype of a complete mole? It is diploid, so 46 and XX. It can be 46XY, 46YY, but that, that's rare. The most common karyotype is 46XX. Now let us see what happens in a partial mole on the other hand. In a partial mole, there is an egg which is not empty. The egg has the maternal chromosome and it gets fertilized by two sperms diaspermy diaspermic they are diaspermic and because they are diaspermic what happens it results in a triploid conceptus triploid conceptus now that is also not normal now this is what we call as a partial mole Okay, and in a partial mole, again, that MCQ that they ask you is what is the most common karyotype? Now, the most common karyotype is going to be triploid, so 69 XXX is the most common. If that's not in the option, it is XXY. Okay, so these are your pathological or etiological basis of what causes a molar pregnancy and Prithvi yes it can be x y y also but again that's rare I want you to remember the most common ones at least right now moving on further what happens because of this chromosomally abnormal fertilizations on the figure a and on the figure b what is figure a and what is figure b which one is complete mole guys and which one is partial mole which one is complete mole which one is partial mole 
right? So you can see here in this figure, it is a gross specimen showing you only, only chorionic villi. You cannot see any fetal tissue at all. So this is a complete mole. In a complete mole, there is no maternal genetic material at all, right? So there is no fetus that is developing. So there is no fetal tissue, right? There is extensive trophoblastic proliferation in and you know the trophoblastic the chorionic villi they are hydropically degenerated the villi are entirely avascular there is no fetal tissue at all on the other hand figure number b is showing you a partial mole in a partial mole there is you know some fetal tissue is there this fetal tissue is going to be there but it is a triploid conceptus so this fetus is not going to survive most of the time it is going to actually die so fetal tissue will be present but it is not going to be healthy fetal tissue there might be some placenta developing but you can see cystic degeneration of the uh, placenta that is trying to form so there is less extensive trophoblastic proliferation on histopath you can see trophoblastic scalloping there is focal degeneration of the villi some parts may be vascular some parts may be avascular so this is the histopathological differentiation between a complete mole and a partial mole you see the extent of the trophoblastic degeneration we see whether the villi are vascular or not we see whether any t fetal tissue is present or not so the uh, prithvi scalloping means that they are arranged in a folded manner on histopath the trophoblastic chorionic villi okay the tissue that is a histopathological appearance that's why i mentioned seen on histopathology right now one thing you can appreciate from here is that since there is a lot of uh, chorionic villi proliferation which is in comparison to a normal pregnancy much much more what are you going to see one thing that is very important to note here is you're going to see that such conceptuses such pregnancy will have excessive beta hcg excessive beta hcg secretion coming from these chorionic villi and that is going to explain the uh, you know excessive nausea and vomiting the possibility of hyper emesis in these pregnancies right what else is this excessive beta hcg going to do what else is this excessive beta HCG going to do, guys? Very good, Parbeen Shah. Cyst of the ovary. So, theca lutein cyst, right? So, this beta HCG, since it is excessive, right, it can also act like LH hormone because of the sharing of the alpha subunit with the LH hormone and the beta subunit of the HCG quite resembles the beta subunit of LH also. So it can stimulate the lutein cells of the ovarian follicles resulting in theca lutein cysts of the ovaries, right? So these are what we can see also in these situations. And there can be a other set of medical complications as well. So very good, uh, Prithvi, you're saying thyrotoxicosis. Yes, now excessive beta-HCG can act also like TSH hormone and can lead to the stimulation of the maternal thyroid gland and can lead to hyperthyroidism uh, symptoms, okay? But that is going to be a transient phenomena, only going to last as long as the trophoblastic tissue is inside the uterus. There can be risk of early onset uh, preeclampsia because of extensive chorionic villi proliferation. The other medical complication that can result is that these small chorionic villi, these uh, grape-like vesicles, they form grape-like vesicles inside the uterus. This fill the uterus. So these small grape-like vesicles you see, especially when the uterus is stimulated and contracting, at that time they can, you know, seep into the maternal circulation via the uterine veins, then they can enter the systemic uh, venous circulation of the mother.
mother and then can go to the lungs also leading to pulmonary embolism and pulmonary edema right so that can be a medical complication uh, they can or uh, they often present the most common clinical presentation of a molar pregnancy would be bleeding and they can bleed for days if left undiagnosed so in the face of bleeding anemia can also be a complication now all of these complications excessive nausea vomiting hyperemesis theca lutein cysts all of these medical complications are more in which kind of molar pregnancy complete molar partial molar they are all more commonly encountered in which type of molar pregnancy complete mole or partial mole yes guys what is the answer all of these complications they are more in complete mole as compared to partial mole they are extremely rare in partial mole actually right so please remember this important finding also and the other important thing is the beta hcg values the excessive beta hcg values they are going to be usually more than 10 to the power 5 international units per liter in complete mole and they are lesser beta hcg in cases of partial mole lesser than 10 to the power 5 international units per liter okay now moving on further let's have a look at the case scenario so we've quickly revised what is molar pregnancy we've quickly revised what is uh, the pathology behind it we've quickly revised what are the complications what can all happen with molar pregnancy now let's see have a look at the clinical case scenario now there's a 20 year old primi who came to the casualty with 3 months of amenorrhea with complaint of excessive nausea vomiting that's your first clue irregular vaginal bleeding for the past one week and her home based urine pregnancy test is positive right so pregnant with excessive nausea vomiting irregular vaginal bleeding i'll give you more information the vitals are stable so it's not like she is bleeding excessively the cardio respiratory examination is also normal it is very important to do a baseline chest auscultation because of the risk of associated pulmonary embolism right and it is also very very important to ask in history whether she is suffering from you know persistent cough or whether she is having difficulty breathing so these kind of symptoms should be asked to a woman when we are suspecting molar pregnancy the bleeding itself is mild often on lower abdominal pain she complains of and that's your another clue on per abdominal examination you find that the uterus is enlarged to 16 week size the fetal parts are not palpable the fsh is not heard my question to you is what is the differential diagnosis so you see here that the period of amenorrhea is 3 months right so first of all i would confirm whether she is actually 3 months so make sure that the dates are accurate make sure of dates whether she is sure of dates or not recalculate and check she could be wrong dates also right so let's say she is sure of her dates then the uterus is enlarged to more than expected according to the period of gestation that is because of extensive trophoblastic proliferation however please remember it is not always going to be more than the expected age so usually the size of the uterus is going to be larger than the period of gestation in a case of more or pregnancy but it can be of the same size or it can even be smaller okay like for example had it been a partial mole then in a small uh, small dead fetus you could have a smaller than expected period of gestation in a molar pregnancy as well so your differential diagnosis the first one that is coming to your mind is molar pregnancy i believe because of excessive nausea vomiting bleeding being the most common presenting symptom and the fact that the uterus is enlarged more than the expected period of gestation but please make sure of the dates as well she could be an abortion with wrong date she could be an abortion with wrong dates she could be a multiple pregnancy 
she could be a multiple pregnancy with two small fetuses and for some reason you're not able to auscultate the fetal heart rate which is quite possible the other differential diagnosis could be polyhydroamnios right maybe there is excessive liquor inside and that's why you're not able to palpate the fetal parts because it's all tense with distended liquor maybe that's why you're not able to auscultate the fetal heart on your stethoscope as well it could be a fibroid with a pregnancy there could be a small 8 week 10 week i'm just making a guess there could be a small baby inside a small embryo inside and this uterus is enlarged why because maybe it's a fibroid there with a pregnancy so these are all differential diagnosis of molar pregnancy which needs to be considered and one simple step to come to the final diagnosis is plain and simple what would be the simplest step to come to the final diagnosis plain and simple what would be it? How would you differentiate? Very plain and simple. You perform an ultrasound. You perform an ultrasound and there you will have it. You will have your diagnosis. Beta HCG will not help you make the diagnosis between these differential diagnosis, DJ Rockstar, right? So at the offset, if I have to do some investigation in this situation, I'll do a, a, an ultrasound which will make my diagnosis if it's an abortion with wrong dates if there's a multiple pregnancy if there's a polyhydroamnios if there's a fibroid with pregnancy so to make the diagnosis you will first need in this clinical profile an ultrasound okay now let's get going further and let's talk about it a little bit more i'll give you more information about this case same 20 year old primy i've confirmed she's 12 weeks period of gestation sure of dates regular cycles excessive nausea vomiting irregular vaginal bleeding for one week she'd done a home-based urine pregnancy test that came out to be positive her pulse rate is 100 her bp is 100 by 10 by 70 now this 100 pulse rate could be because of two reasons can you give me the two reasons why they there could be tachycardia in a case of uh, molar pregnancy can you give me two reasons why there is going to be tachycardia in a case of molar pregnancy or three reasons give me three reasons why there can be tachycardia in a case of molar pregnancy a it could be bleeding right so, significant bleeding that is causing tachycardia anything else anything else guys b it could be a symptom of excessive thyroid stimulation, thyroid hyperthyroidism could lead to tachycardia and you know any incidental cause like fever could cause her tachycardia. So it's very important to check the temperature also. Let's say the temperature is normal. I told you the importance of cardiorespiratory examination also. Very important to auscultate the chest uh, to look for any evidence of uh, pulmonary uh, embolism and anything then you know obviously you have to note the respiratory rate of the woman note whether she is breathless or not or she's complaining of persistent cough uh, bleeding is mild often on lower abdominal pain could be there there's no breathlessness no history of tremors important to ask history of tremors also because that would also go more in favor of having coincident uh, having simultaneously uh, hyperthyroidism like symptoms along with it on per abdominal examination the findings were already given to you 16 week size fetal paths not palpable you did a pv also you did a pv also it confirms your uterine enlargement there are non-tender bilateral adnexal masses about five centimeter which are felt through the furnaces so what is your diagnosis now what is your diagnosis now you have confirmed that the uterus indeed is enlarged right with excessive nausea vomiting tachycardia uh, you know bilateral adnexal masses you are going more and more in the direction of most likely a molar pregnancy isn't it most likely a molar pregnancy right and most likely a complete molar pregnancy because of the uterine enlargement which is excessive and what are these adnexal masses? What could these adnexal masses be? They could be theca lutein cysts. They could be theca lutein cysts. So how do you confirm? You confirm by doing a ultrasound. So you have to confirm the diagnosis. That is your plan. That is your first step. You will confirm the diagnosis. Your second step would be 
a pre treatment evaluation you have to evaluate the woman before you treat her and third would be giving her a definite treatment so these are your step number 1 step number 2 step number 3 so to confirm the diagnosis you and the fourth step is post treatment follow up also so these are the four concerns in management of a woman who's come with the clinical presentation of molar pregnancy so to confirm the diagnosis you have to go ahead and do an ultrasound so which is a and which is b which is a guys what is your diagnosis here your ultrasound shows this picture what's your diagnosis here figure number a yes investigation of choice becomes ultrasound investigation of choice becomes ultrasound to make a diagnosis okay we're going step wise in a clinical profile so first you have to make a diagnosis right so this is complete mole very good why figure number a is complete mole you can see no fetus inside you can see only these small small vesicles which are filling the uterine cavity this appearance is called as snowstorm appearance snowstorm appearance so this is complete mole this is complete mole likely okay likely i would still stay likely figure number b here is what is this there is a fetus here and this is most likely going to be a dead fetus you can sometimes appreciate a cystic placenta you can sometimes appreciate a cystic placenta but it might might not always be there there is going to be a dead fetus you might or might not appreciate a cystic placenta that is why your partial mole is most often in clinical practice it is most often misdiagnosed as missed abortion so how is the definitive diagnosis missed how is the definitive diagnosis made 100% definitive diagnosis would be made once you have evacuated these products and send them off for histopath then you will get a 100% definitive diagnosis that this is a either a complete mole or a partial mole okay so let's say what our report came our report showed in our case it showed a heterogeneous mass inside the uterine cavity with cystic spaces no fetal parts the endometrial junction is well preserved what does that mean the endometrial junction is well preserved if you read this report what are you going to make of this report endometrial junction well preserved what would it mean what would it mean anybody that means that the molar tissue is not invading into the myometrium that is what it would mean right that the molar tissue is not invading into the myometrium both ovaries are enlarged in cystic measuring 4 cm the ultrasound shows that the liver spleen kidneys are all normal there is no free fluid in the peritoneal cavity so this is the kind of report that you are going to get and this is the kind of appearance that you are going to get on a complete molar pregnancy now what is the pre treatment evaluation going to be now once you've diagnosed molar pregnancy there is important of very very important investigation very very important investigation must not be missed is which one now comes the utility of beta hcg evaluation a baseline beta hcg because these pregnancies after evacuation are going to be followed up with beta hcg right so in the pre treatment evaluation you're going to do a thorough blood workup you're going to do a blood grouping and rh typing because you're planning to evacuate a 16 week size uterus she might bleed during the procedure you need the blood group you need the baseline cbc values you want the baseline liver function test and kidney function test values also and you need the baseline hcg values as well so this is what is going to be incorporated into your pre treatment evaluation 
and a baseline chest x-ray also it should not be like some things were missed maybe she decompensates and becomes breathless immediately after the evacuation or during the evacuation and then you are lost because you never checked for the possibility of uh, pulmonary uh, emboli so a baseline chest x-ray should definitely be included in the pre-treatment evaluation and if there are symptoms suggestive of high hyperthyroidism, uh, excessive tachycardia without any fever, without any visible blood loss or there is uh, tremors, you should also screen for hyperthyroidism and do a thyroid profile as well. And the most important is a beta HCG evaluation. Now let's see what our report says. Our report says blood group A positive, HP 8 gram, TLC platelet count fine, LFT, KFT normal, chest x-ray baseline report came out to be normal and our serum beta HCG came out to be 1 lakh international units per liter. It is rock star. It is going to be usually going to be much, much higher than your 3500 international units. It's going to be in the range of lakhs usually when you do the beta HCG. So after you see these reports, before evacuation, you have to ensure that you keep blood ready. That is why it was important to see the HP. You will ensure that you give her blood transfusion, right? It is only 8 gram. You have to have a surgical procedure. You want to evacuate the uterus. The whole process will entail blood loss. So that is why it is important to have a baseline blood workup. Also, when you are planning a surgical evacuation, because that's your treatment of choice. How do you evacuate a complete molar pregnancy? How do you do that? How do you do that? Do you go for, uh, do you go for oxytocin induction of labor? Do you go for prostaglandins like mesoprostol? Do you go for suction and evacuation? Do you go for curettage? Or I can write, I can just keep the list ongoing with the number of procedures that can be done to evacuate the uterus. Your treatment of choice is going to be out of all of these options. What's your treatment of choice? Always, always suction and evacuation is your treatment of choice. You will not use oxytocin induction of labor alone. You will not use prostaglandins alone. You will not use curettage alone because it's a big uterus. How long will you keep curating it out, right? So oxytocin and prostaglandins, there is a theoretical concern with these drugs is that, that they're going to cause forceful uterine contractions, you see. And when they are forceful uterine contractions, there is an increased risk of the chorionic villi, those grape-like vesicles leaking into the systemic circulation of the mother. And then a theoretical risk exists of pulmonary embolism occurring during the process of evacuation so they should not be used alone so that's why your therapy of choice your treatment of choice is always and always a suction evacuation right now moving on further i'll ask you one question if i say give you a blanket statement that oxytocin is contraindicated during evacuation is it true or false true or false True or false, oxytocin infusion is contraindicated during evacuation. True or false? Why false? See, it is not to be the method of termination. It is not to be the method of evacuation. But while you are doing suction and evacuation, right, and you're halfway through your procedure, usually people start oxytocin infusion to help your expulsion of contents right and secondly when you are doing the evacuation your primary modality is suction and evacuation but if there is excessive bleeding in the face of excessive bleeding if you want the uterus to contract because there is excessive bleeding you have to use oxytocin so it is not contraindicated we can use if there is excessive bleeding, if there is excessive bleeding during your process of evacuation, you can use it. Okay. Now the other question. 
what about curettage so curettage is not the sole method of evacuating the uterus but after completion of suction after completion of suction that you were doing suction and evacuation and no more contents are coming out it seems that the uterus is empty now at the end of the procedure can you do a curettage or not can you do a check curettage just to confirm that you've removed everything can you do a check curettage yes you can do a sharp curettage okay sharp curettage after the completion can be done okay so this is an important point to note all right now moving on further the next question that i want to ask of you guys is what about hysterectomy what about hysterectomy should hysterectomy be a direct management for let's say somebody who's completed her family let's say for example our case woman was 35 year old let's say i have a woman who's 45 year old and she has a complete molar pregnancy should i do a hysterectomy for her should i do a hysterectomy for her yes okay now if i do a hysterectomy i'm just discussing with you since you're saying yes if i do a hysterectomy for her what advantage am i gaining i'm just discussing the role of hysterectomy here. what advantage am i gaining risk of neoplasia will or persistent or development to gestational trophoblastic neoplasia you are saying would decrease i agree it will decrease substantially but will it become zero will it become zero will it become nil will it become nil no it will not become nil because even when you know what happens is that you might remove the uterus but there's always a possibility that micro metastasis might have occurred uh, prior to the evacuation also so hysterectomy a is not going to make the risk of future gtn zero not going to make the is not making the risk of future gtn zero so it's not like 100 percent protection secondly she will still need beta hcg follow-up she will still need beta hcg follow up so when to do a hysterectomy on the other hand doing a hysterectomy is a major surgical procedure it can involve complications per se of hysterectomy as well so it's a major decision a woman will use her you lose her uterus and future fertility options right moreover three to four years down the line i mean you know after hysterectomy ovarian function also starts waning so she'll end up having a premature menopause also so there are many concerns regarding the performance of hysterectomy for a potentially benign indication as well so the role of hysterectomy is limited let's see what novak says about hysterectomy novak says that if the patient desires surgical sterilization hysterectomy may be performed the ovary may be preserved at the time of surgery even in the presence of prominent threca lutein cysts so it is not saying that hysterectomy is a definite management for multi-paris women no that's what i'm trying to tell you that even in multi-paris women you see the treatment of modality of first choice will be a suction and evacuation if the patient desires a surgical his sterilization then a hysterectomy may be performed now the other role of hysterectomy would be let's say you were doing the procedure and uh, during suction and evacuation during suction and evacuation there is intractable bleeding uncontrollable bleeding it went out of your hands you did oxytocin infusion you tried to manage but it is just not getting control then you might need to resort to a hysterectomy or let's say for example there is a perforating invasive mole there is a perforating invasive mole which is causing extension when the invasive mole is you know locally invasive it eats into the myometrium it can even end up perforating the uterus and then it can lead to massive intraperitoneal hemorrhage and shock 
Now, in these situations, if there is massive intraperitoneal hemorrhage and shock, then you might need to resort to a hysterectomy to save the woman's life. So, the utility of hysterectomy is limited. Your main treatment is suction and evacuation. Clear on this, right? Now, our patient also had theca lutein cysts. Anything need to be done for theca lutein cysts? Anything needs to be done for theca lutein cysts? How are they managed? Any extra treatment for theca lutein cysts? Theca lutein cysts need no treatment for itself because they are actually going to spontaneously regress in another two to four months, another two to four months after evacuation because the source of uh, stimulation is the HCG that is coming from the uh, chorionic tissue. Once that is out, these cysts are going to regress. But if there is torsion, if there is torsion of these ovaries, then it becomes an acute surgical emergency. Then it becomes an acute surgical emergency. But if they are not creating any problems like torsion, no treatment needs to be done for these theca lutein cysts. Okay. Now, moving on further, let's talk about the follow-up after evacuation, right? Follow-up after evacuation, my first question to you is, why is follow-up needed? And I think I answered that question in yesterday's session also when somebody asked me. Follow-up is plain and simply needed because of the risk of subsequent GTN after a molar pregnancy. Now, the question that they will ask you in exam and most often have asked you is, what is this risk? How much is this risk? So, how how much is the risk of subsequent GTN overall and specifically how much is the risk of subsequent choriocarcinoma because GTN will involve all invasive mole also choriocarcinoma also right and the most common GTN to occur after a molar pregnancy is going to be an invasive mole and then a choriocarcinoma and your other placental site and endothelial type of GTN, they are very rare, right? So, what is the risk? Anybody giving me percentages for that? Complete mole and partial mole? What is the risk of having a subsequent GTN with complete mole? If you have to remember one percentage, you should be remembering about complete mole because complete mole is much, much more common as partial mole in clinical practice. So what is the risk of subsequent GTN, guys, with complete mole? It's about 15 to 20%. And the risk of subsequent choriocarcinoma is about 4%. Okay. With partial mole, this risk is about 1% to 4% here. And it is less than 1% as far as the risk of subsequent choriocarcinoma is considered. Now, the other important things that you need to know is how long is follow-up done? Follow-up is done with beta HCG. That is why you needed the baseline levels to compare with. So how long is the follow-up done? Immediately after evacuation, you see, one should always check beta HCG about 48 hours after the evacuation to see if there is a rapid decline or not. After that, the follow-up is weekly till three back-to-back -back normal values, till three consecutive normal values. And after that, followed by monthly for six months. So it is a long follow-up. It is a long follow-up. Now, the next question is, what is the average time taken for beta HCG values to become normal? What is the average time? In a case of complete mole, what is the average time for the beta HCG to come back to normal, guys? And what is the average time in a case of partial mole to come back to normal? In a complete mole, the average time for taken to the beta HCG to come back to normal is about 9 weeks. And for partial mole, it's about 7 weeks weeks. So, higher the beta HCG levels, the more longer they will take to come back to normal. And beta HCG levels were higher in complete mole to 
begin with and that is why because we are following up with beta hcg it is very very important to have contraception in place during follow up time the woman should not be conceiving why is that why should the woman not conceive while she is on follow up with beta hcg while she is on follow up for molar pregnancy post evacuation what is the reason yes guys why should there be a woman on contraception why should she not get pregnant what is the reason why is this contraception so important that they are asking you questions about it the reason why contraception is important is that if a woman conceives during follow up there will be fresh beta hcg coming from a pregnancy right and that fresh beta hcg will confound your follow up it will ruin your follow up because what will you follow up now there's excessive fresh beta hcg coming from a new pregnancy right so contraception during follow up is important and your drug of choice is oral contraceptive pills barriers are safe like condoms are safe but they have a higher failure rate therefore if you have to choose one it's oral contraceptive pills your progesterone pills your progesterone injectable progesterone implants are all safe they are fine but your drug of choice is oral contraceptive pills please remember intra uterine devices like copper t and mirena they are absolutely contra indicated because if you put a copper t or a mirena or an intra uterine device inside and there is an invasive mole that is developing your chances of perforation with this copper t inside the uterus are going to increase therefore your iud's or intra uterine devices are absolutely contraindicated so that should never be given now moving on further let's have a look at our case scenario back again we began with a 20 year old primi with complete molar pregnancy right she had bilateral theca lutein cysts she also had anemia in our case we had found her hb was 8 baseline hcg was 1 lakh we did a suction evacuation she also received two units of blood transfusion right because i wanted her hb from 8 to become at least 10 she was going through a surgical procedure and her repeat hcg after 48 hours was 50000 so there was a dramatic fall i am happy bleeding has stopped i am happy right now what i want to ask you here is should i be giving her anything else apart from follow up i put her on follow up but should i be giving her any prophylactic chemotherapy should i be giving her any prophylactic chemotherapy to prevent future gtn is there any role of prophylactic chemotherapy without gtn having occurred is there any role of prophylactic chemotherapy yes or no prophylactic chemotherapy has some role in all cases true or false true or false the question is okay let's have a look at this scenario do you want to give her chemotherapy her beta hcg is declining bleeding has stopped now should i give her a prophylactic chemotherapy methotrexate bhi de de should we give it to her before gtn has actually developed there is no role of routine prophylactic therapy this is false statement this statement if you encounter in examination mark it as false statement there is no role of routine prophylactic chemotherapy it is only given when indicated it is to be given when indicated why because hamare paas ek hi drug hai the drug that we have is methotrexate so what they saw in studies when they conducted was that when women are given prophylactic chemotherapy it increases the chances of being resistant to these drugs later on when they did develop chemo, when they did develop gtn the same drug was not working anymore this is the drug for prophylactic chemotherapy this is the drug for treatment of gtn also right so there was this risk of drug resistance if you are rampantly going to use routine prophylactic chemotherapy in all cases and unnecessary side effects of mesopro uh, sorry methotrexate in those women so the advance so the uh, recommendation is that it should be only given when indicated 
right so what are those indications now right so let us see what novax has to say about this prophylactic chemotherapy prophylaxis may be particularly useful in management of high risk complete molar pregnancy only and specially when what when hcg assessments for follow up are unavailable or unreliable so if you're putting a woman on follow up there is no need for prophylaxis chemo therapy clear on this so what are the indications of giving chemotherapy after molar pregnancy evacuation in our case the beta hcg levels after 48 hours they had dropped down in our case the bleeding had stopped what if the bleeding had persisted the bleeding didn't stop persistent bleeding continuing even after evacuation right intraperitoneal bleeding intraperitoneal bleeding significant enough to cause you know uh, raise the suspicion of uh, you know uh, invasive mole so persistent bleeding and intraperitoneal bleeding when they are happening we are clinically suspecting see we are acting on clinical suspicion we are clinically suspecting invasive mole now that becomes an indication of giving chemotherapy prophylactic chemotherapy after molar pregnancy evacuation so let's be let's better call it post evacuation chemotherapy on post evacuation while we were doing that weekly follow up rising or plateauing serum beta hcg during follow up again are pointing towards the possibility of development of gtn gestational trophoblastic neoplasia or it has been 4 weeks after evacuation and still the beta hcg levels are more than 20000 international units per liter these are some of the recommended indications of giving post evacuation chemotherapy in molar pregnancy cases all right now moving on further so dr dj there's no score for it but there are yes definitely indications have been defined in which cases you can give post molar pregnancy evacuation chemotherapy now she comes back for follow up after one week so i sent her home i took her uh, kept her in the hospital for two more days under observation and then sent her back home and called her up after a week for a follow up visit right now what do i ask her what do i see in this follow up visit don't just see the blood report of the woman also examine the woman also take a history taking at each subsequent visit you ask her about her amount of bleeding it should have been stopped right so she should not be having a persistent bleeding ask her about pulmonary symptoms she could be disregarding uh, you know breathlessness or 